Would you want to be like Elijah the prophet? You know, on today's program, I'm going to show you that if you would like to be like him, then Jesus would rebuke you. There's a difference in the way God deals with people today. This will help you, so stay tuned for the gospel truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I tell you, again, today, let me just welcome those of you that are new viewers. We just added uh, KCAL in Los Angeles, 16 million people under that signal, and Winston-Salem, North Carolina, High Point, uh, Harrisburg, uh, York, Pennsylvania, just a lot of new stations coming on. And I'm excited about sharing with you this nearly too good to be true news that God loves you separate from what you deserve. It's not about you getting what you deserve. You get what Jesus deserves if you put faith in Jesus as your Savior. And this is really the dominant message that I preach is about the unconditional love and acceptance of the Lord towards us. And it all hinges upon what Jesus has done for us. And so I talk about the grace of God, the mercy of God a lot. And you know, the, probably one of the biggest oppositions that I get to this teaching comes from people who have been steeped in religion. And the reason is because religion by and large teaches that our relationship with God is based primarily on our performance. When you do well, God treats you well. When you do bad, God is angry at you. God is liable to judge you, put sickness in your body, cause a hurricane, a tsunami, an earthquake, judge the nation, the wrath of God. Most people believe that they are in the hands of an angry God. But that's not accurate. And did you know some of this inaccuracy comes from Scripture? And when I say that, I, I know some people are thinking I'm saying, so you don't believe that the Scripture is infallible and that it's really God's Word. No, that's not it at all. I believe God's Word, the Bible, is 100% accurate. But there is a difference in the way that God dealt with people under the Old Covenant and a way that He deals with people today. And the difference is all because of Jesus. Jesus came and took our punishment and took God's wrath and satisfied the wrath of God. So that today, if a person dies and goes to hell, it's not because God is angry with them because of their sin. Their sin has been paid for. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says that Jesus is the propitiation, that means the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. All sins, past, present, and even future tense sins have been atoned for. It is not our individual sins that is offending God. God has dealt with all sin. The only issue now is whether or not we accept Jesus as our Savior. If a person goes to hell, they go to hell for the rejection of of the payment for their sins, which is Jesus, not because of their individual sins. That's a major difference. Major difference. God isn't dealing with us based on our performance, based on our actions. It all boils down to, have you made Jesus your Lord? If you have made Jesus your Lord from your heart, confessed Him as your personal Lord, and your faith is truly in Him, then God loves you completely disproportional to what you deserve. He loves you because you've accepted His Son. If you haven't accepted His Son, God loves you and has paid for all of your sins through His Son. He's offering mercy to you. But if you were to die without ever accepting Jesus as your personal Lord, you would suffer the wrath of God, not for your individual sins because they've been paid for, but you would suffer the wrath of God for rejecting such a great sacrifice as God sending His Son and paying for your sins and you just rejecting it and thinking, no, I'm going to believe that God's going to accept me because I'm a relatively good person. Boy, I guarantee you that'll draw the wrath of God that you think that His Son and the sacrifice of His Son is not important. It all hinges on that. Let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. This, I believe, a scriptural example will help make my point. 
Here in Luke chapter 9, it says in verse 51, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. This is talking about Jesus should be uh, crucified and then resurrected and go back to his father. So it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers before his face and they went and entered, entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him and they did not receive him. This is talking about these Samaritans did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now let me, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, let me just give you the background here. The nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. There was the northern ten tribes which were called Israel and the southern two tribes which were called Judah. And the southern two tribes as a whole served and held to God uh, stronger in their covenant relationship with God than the northern tribes. Because of this, the northern tribes were judged and taken into captivity. And uh, the king of Syria, literally, Assyria, literally put colonists, he put Assyrian colonists back in the northern ten tribes and they colonized that area. And so the Jews who were left there started intermarrying with these colonists that had come back which according to the Jewish religion was absolutely forbidden. And so the strict Jews that were in Jerusalem and the rest of the nation of Israel at the time of this writing, they resented and rejected. There was a racial prejudice against the Samaritans. And it wasn't only racial, but the Samaritans had also, because they married these Assyrian colonists who had moved in there, they had perverted the true worship of God. And because of the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans, they wouldn't go down to Jerusalem and worship the true way that God had prescribed in the temple. They made their own temple in Samaria, and they had their own form of worship. Now, they were still claiming to worship the God of Israel, but it was perverted. It had all of these Assyrian things in it. So the Samaritans were uh, a racial, impure race, and they also had a perverted religious system. And because of this, there was tremendous rejection of the Samaritans by the Jews. And there's examples of this in John chapter 4 where Jesus dealt with the Samaritan woman and she was shocked that a Jew would even talk to her. There's also the example of the good Samaritan who helped a man who had been beaten up by robbers and Jesus was showing that even this Samaritan who the Jews hated and thought no Samaritan could ever have a relationship with God, that the Samaritan was more in relationship with God than all of the holy Jews were. So anyway, this is a constant theme throughout the Bible, if you aren't familiar with that. But because of this hatred, religious and racial, the two strongest prejudices that we know today, because of this, a strict Jew, you know, if you were coming from the northern part of Israel down to Jerusalem, they would literally go a day or two days journey out of the way to go around Samaria because Samaria was right in the center of the nation of Israel. So because of this, people would go around. It was unusual that people would go straight through Samaria. That's what Jesus was doing. And it's also important to recognize that in the fourth chapter of the book of John, Jesus had already ministered to the Samaritans this woman at the well, and it says the whole city of Samaria had received Jesus as their Lord. Now, I don't know that that means every single person, but certainly a majority of these people had already been exposed to Jesus, had recognized Him as the Messiah, and they were willing to worship Him when He just came on their turf and ministered to them strictly about things of God. But it says here in Luke chapter 9 and in verse uh, 50. Three, it says they did not receive him because, here's the reason, his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. This meant that because of his association with the religious Jews in Jerusalem, they rejected Jesus. They wouldn't even give him a place to stay. They wouldn't even let him have a room in the hotel. They wouldn't allow him into their city because he was going down to fellowship with those religious Jews that they hated. Now remember, these were people who had already been convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. The fourth chapter of the book of John, they had accepted him as their Savior. They, it wasn't that they didn't know who Jesus was. They knew who he was, but because of his association with their enemies, 
This was a total snub, a rejection of Jesus. It was a harsh criticism of him because of his association with the religious Jews. You need to know all that background to get the full impact of what happened. And so here is what Jesus' disciples wanted to do when they saw this. In verse 54, it says, When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Now, this is an amazing fact. Jesus had been persecuted. He had been rejected. This was a major criticism of Jesus. And two of his disciples, James and John, wanted to call fire down out of heaven and kill all of these sinners. <laughs> Boy, they were called the sons of thunder. I wonder why they were called that. Apparently, they had quite a temper. And this was actually, it was wrong what had been done to Jesus and so they just figured that it would be just to call down God's judgment on them. And they wanted to do what Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, did in 2 Kings chapter 1, where he called fire down out of heaven and killed 102 people who came out to persecute him. And they wanted to release God's wrath on these sinners and destroy them. But you know what Jesus did in verse 55, it says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. Jesus rebuked his disciples for wanting to do what was done in the Old Testament. And you know what this says? There's a difference between the way God dealt with sin in the Old Testament and the way he deals with it in the New Testament. And that's what we're beginning to explain. So I read the passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 9 where Jesus was going to go through Samaria. He sent some people ahead to see if they could get accommodations for him. And the people of Samaria rejected him because of his association with the hypocritical Jews. And because of this, two of Jesus' own disciples, James and John, wanted to call fire down out of heaven and kill all of these people. Bring the judgment and the wrath of God on him. And this wasn't something that they just hatched out of their own heart. Do you know where they got this from? They got it from the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 1. I'm not going to take time to turn over there and read all of this. But in 2 Kings chapter 1, Elijah the prophet of God called fire out of heaven and killed 102 soldiers. Now, the, the story here, 2 Kings chapter 1, if you want to read it on your own, uh, you can verify all of these facts. But there was a king named Ahaziah, and this king hurt himself. He fell through the roof of his, of his own house or through the second story. He had injured himself. The scripture doesn't say what the problem was. It must have been some type of an infection or something. And he was in bad shape. And so he sent some of his servants to Ekron to inquire of the priest of Baal whether he would recover. Now remember, this was a king of Israel. These were the people of God. And yet he totally rejected the God of Israel and he was sending to the God of Ekron named Baal to ask whether he could recover. I mean, this was a total rejection of God. And as the messengers went to Ekron, uh, Elijah, the prophet of God, was told by God what was going on. He intercepted the messengers and he told them to go back and you tell the king that he could have recovered, but because he is going to inquire of a pagan God instead of turning to the God of Israel, but for this reason, he is going to die and he'll never get off the bed that he's now laying on. And so the messengers turn around and Ahaziah realized that they didn't have time to make it all the way to Ekron. And so they said, why have you turned back? And the messenger said, well, there was a man that meant us and said, thus saith the Lord. And then they delivered this message that Ahaziah was going to die. And when Ahaziah heard this, he says, what kind of man was he? And they said he was a hairy man and he was wearing a, a, a leather girdle. And immediately he says, it's Elijah the Tishbite. Apparently, Elijah had quite a reputation for the way he dressed and how much hair he had. We don't know if this is talking about body hair or if it's talking about like a beard. Some people believe that this was just, he had a super long beard. But regardless, immediately Ahaziah recognized that this was Elijah the prophet. And again, to get the full impact of this story, you've got to know the history here because Ahaziah was the son of Ahab the previous king of Israel. 
And Ahab and his wife Jezebel had just literally given themselves over to the devil and had served the devil with everything that they had. They rejected God. They rejected all morality. And he did many things wrong, but one of them that he did wrong was he, there was a vineyard that was very close to his palace, and he would look out of his palace and see this vineyard, and so he lusted for it, and he wanted this vineyard. He went down and talked to the owner, whose name was Naboth, and said, I'll buy it from you. And Naboth said, nope, this is my family inheritance. You'll never get this. I don't care how much money you offered me. So the king, Ahab, went and was crying in his bedroom. And the queen, Jezebel, walks in and says, what are you crying about? Aren't you the king? What's the matter? And he says, Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. And boy, she got upset and she said, you leave it to me. And what she did, she had some people kill him. And so after they killed Naboth, well, then Ahab took possession, ownership of Naboth's vineyard, and he was walking up and down the rows of the vineyard. And as he turned a corner, all of a sudden there stood Elijah, the prophet of God. And he says, have you found me, oh, my enemy? And Elijah says, your sins have found you out. And he says, because you did this to Naboth, he says, dogs are going to lick your blood in this exact spot, and the dogs are going to eat your wife, Jezebel. And it came to pass. There was a battle. The king died. They brought his chariot down to the vineyard, and in that exact spot, they were getting, beginning to clean it out. The dogs started licking the blood of Ahab that had died in that chariot. And later, after Ahaziah died, Jehu came in and took over the kingdom, and the queen, uh, Jezebel, was still alive. He drove up to the city walls. He asked who was on the Lord's side. Some people stuck their head out of these windows, and he says, throw that wicked woman out, and they threw Jezebel out two or three stories, and she landed on the ground, and then Jehu drove his chariot back and forth across Jezebel until he was confident she was dead, and then he went in, sat down, and started having a meal. And in the middle of his meal, he said, you know, that was a king's daughter, and she was the queen. We ought to go bury her. So he sent his people out to bury her. And when they got there, all that they found was her skull, the palms of her hands, and the bottoms of her feet. The dogs had eaten the rest of her body. And the word of God that was spoken through Elijah, the Tishbite, came to pass. Now this is Ahaziah, the king who was the son of Ahab and Jezebel. And he knew the prophecy that had already come to pass on his father. He knew that Elijah was uh, against them because they had forsaken the true God. And that's probably the reason that he didn't go to Elijah to inquire about whether he had recovered of this infection that he had. But instead, he went to a pagan god of another country. But anyway, he knew exactly who this was. And he got so furious... He was mad at Elijah for what had happened to him personally, the prophecy that was given to him, but also Elijah had prophesied the death of his father and that the dogs would lick his blood, which in those days was a tremendous insult. And um, he was mad at him for the personal prophecy, for what had happened to his family. And so he sent a soldier out with 50 other soldiers, a captain with 50 people under him, and they found Elijah sitting up on this hill. And they said, the king has said, come down quickly. And Elijah said, if I'm a true man of God, then let fire fall from heaven and consume you and your 50. And instantly the fire of God fell from heaven and killed 51 people. Well, Ahaziah the king heard about what had happened and he just sent another soldier, band of soldiers out. And so this captain came and said, Oh, thou man of God, the Lord has said, Come down quickly. And Elijah said, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And it says there in 2 Kings chapter 1, I believe it's verse 12, that the fire of God fell. It wasn't the fire of the devil, and this wasn't just Elijah that had this power in himself. This was the fire of God fell and burned up this man and his 50 soldiers. So that's 102 soldiers killed by the fire of God. So Ahaziah sent another captain out, and this man came, and he said, Elijah, O thou man of God, he says, I am a servant of God. All I'm doing is obeying the king. I'm following orders. Have mercy on me. Don't kill me the way that you killed the previous captains that came out. And so Elijah prayed, and the Lord said, Go with him. I'll protect you. Elijah went down, talked to Ahaziah, 
enforced the prophecy. Ahaziah may have wanted to kill him, but he couldn't, and he let Elijah go, and the thing was over. Now, this is what Jesus' disciples were referring to. They said, do you want us to call fire down from heaven the way that Elijah did? They were trying to emulate an Old Testament prophet. They were wanting to be like an Old Testament prophet. And look at Jesus' reactions. It said in verse 55, it says, He turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. The Son of Man, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Jesus rebuked His disciples for trying to do what was done by God in the Old Testament. Now, that's a radical thought. If you can put these two things together, you know, a lot of people, when they read the Bible, they don't ever connect these dots and ask these questions. But now, this is major right here. The disciples of Jesus wanted to do what Elijah did, and Jesus rebuked them for wanting to do exactly what Elijah did in the Old Testament. So let me say it this way that if Jesus would have been manifest in his physical body in his earthly ministry back in 2 Kings chapter 1 where Elijah called fire down from heaven, did you know that Jesus would have rebuked Elijah? This was not God's best. Now, it was God. It says it was the fire of God. But it was during a period of time where the wrath of God was being poured out on people. And as we go through this series, I'm going to explain this in a lot more detail and show you why there was this period of time that God poured out His wrath. But in the New Covenant, the wrath of God has now been poured out upon Jesus. And Jesus has borne God's wrath. And God hasn't got any more anger in Him against you for your sins. That anger was placed upon His Son, Jesus, and we live in a different day, a different covenant, a different time. And if people today are trying to enforce the wrath of God the way that, say, Elijah did in the Old Testament, they would be rebuked by Jesus today exactly the way He rebuked His disciples for doing that. The point I'm trying to get across is there is a difference between the way God dealt with sin in the Old Testament and the way God deals with sin in the New Testament. And sad to say, most Christians, quote unquote Christians, have never recognized that difference. They are still trying to represent to the people today that God is the same God of the Old Covenant. Well, it is true that He's the same. He hasn't changed, but His dealings with us have changed because... Now we can be born again. We can become brand new creatures. The Lord now has options to deal with us that He didn't have in the Old Covenant because Jesus has totally changed the way that God deals with people. And if you don't understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, you're going to have a misunderstanding of the true nature of God that is going to hinder you in really receiving the love of God. So that's what we're talking about. And I tell you, I think this series is going to make a huge difference in your life.